Our first scripture reading this morning is uh, taken from the book of Numbers, chapter 11. I'll be reading verses 24 through 30. And if you'd like to follow along, you can find this in the Old Testament portion of your pew Bibles at page 129. Listen for the word of God. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent. And so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Our second lesson this morning is taken from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And this can be found on page 119 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. Listen again for the word of God. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. The word of the Lord. Friends, let us turn to God in prayer. Source of all life, giver of all good gifts, we come to you again this morning. And we ask that you would anoint us with your power. As on that Pentecost day long ago, We pray that you would place upon each of us a tongue of fire in order that our speech, our actions, even our silence would be of you, would bear witness to your goodness and your holiness in the world. Give to each of us everything that we need in order to be faithful to your call on our lives. In the name of the one who lived with and by and through your power, we pray. Amen. Pentecost is the announcement that God's own spirit 
is given generously and powerfully to people in order that they can do the work to which God calls them. God does not call you to do something and then abandon you to figure it out on your own. Pentecost is the promise that God's Spirit will give you everything you need to do what God wants you to do. Not necessarily to do everything that you want to do, nor everything that your family expects you to do, nor everything that the world or your boss or your pastor or your neighborhood expects you to do. But the promise of our faith is that God will give you everything, everything you need in order to do what God wants you to do. And the truth is that there is a lot of work to do. The terror attacks in London just last night, a couple of weeks ago in Manchester, England, at an Ariana Grande concert, we've seen a stabbing, a racially, religiously motivated stabbing on the train in Portland, Oregon. Just this past week, we have seen two high-profile acts of racial intimidation and threat in which LeBron James' house was vandalized with a racial slur and someone left a noose at the National Museum of African American History and Culture in D.C. The work of environmental care suffered a setback this past week as the United States withdrew from a global commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The mainline church in North America continues to try and find its voice, its calling in a new era, a new time, when the culture around us no longer privileges the church, no longer protects the church in the way that it did 30 or 50 years ago. And we could go on and on and on. There is a lot of work to do. And in the face of the large amount of work that there is to do, our two texts today that Mike read for us from Numbers and the book of Acts deliver a much needed injection of confidence, hope, and courage because both of these texts testify that the spirit of the living God, the energy of God to persevere and discern and work and struggle and bear witness is not just reserved for some elite few. The spirit of the living God is delivered generously, is poured out freely and broadly. According to these two texts, God is not stingy with the divine spirit. God does not apparently operate by the lone ranger hero model of leadership that requires some unitary individual of extraordinary capability and skill to get hard things done. According to these two texts, God operates on the community energizing, community galvanizing, community organizing principle of, in the words of the prophet Joel, pouring out my spirit upon all flesh making it possible for your sons and your daughters to prophesy, for your young people to see visions and your old people to dream dreams. In the book of Numbers, the text from the book of Numbers, and when was the last time we read a text from the book of Numbers? In that little text, we are told that the Lord took some of the spirit that was on Moses and put it, that's great that the Spirit is something that you can put. The Lord put it on the 70 elders. You will remember that Moses, leading up to this, Moses was the authority 
of that community. He was the centralized power. He was the liberator, the lawgiver, the forceful presence in that community. Moses was a force to be reckoned with. But in our text, God acts against the monarchical tendency, acts against the hero-generating machinery of humanity, and God democratizes the Holy Spirit. God takes the Spirit, which had so animated and authorized Moses, and God then spreads that Spirit out upon a large group of people. In the text from Acts, there is likewise a large group of disciples and believers gathered together in Jerusalem waiting for the promised gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're not told exactly what they thought they were waiting for, but if they were waiting for the Spirit to identify and select a single person out of their group to rise up and become their hero, to rise up and become their unitary leader, then they were in for a surprise. Because on the day of Pentecost, this is one of those texts, you may be sorry you came to church on this day because this text tells us that when they were all gathered there in the room, tongues of fire started landing on people. So, you know, this is a dangerous day to come to church. Tongues of fire came from God and rested on each person gathered there. No one was left out. Now you think about that. This is a big group of people. It, it, the, according to Acts 1, it looks like it's around 120 people or something. No one was left out. Now in that group, there are people with a wide variety of experiences, a wide variety of histories, which means a wide variety of sins, wide variety of knowledge, all of those kinds of things. No one was left out. There were no exceptions. And just in case the reader might think that those folks gathered there were like the cream of the crop or the best and the brightest that Jerusalem had to offer, the text tells us that the crowds asked, aren't all these people who are speaking Galileans? And in case you don't know, for people in the sophisticated urban center of Jerusalem, to say that someone was from Galilee was not exactly a compliment. It was like saying someone's from out in the boonies, someone from out in the sticks. At Pentecost, according to this text, the Holy Spirit is not reserved for the highly educated, impressively pedigreed city elites. The Spirit pours forth with power upon a big group of people from the country who were given ability and power to lead with authority. The church then and now is formed from the despised of the earth. Brothers and sisters, there is a lot of work to do. And the challenges that we face are very real. But the promise of the Bible is that wherever there are challenges to be faced, our confidence is not in ourselves that we are so clever we can figure this out. Our confidence is in God because God, according to these passages, gives the Spirit to all people. God is not sitting around waiting for some superhero to swoop in and save the day. God pours out the Holy Spirit on ordinary people like us so that your courage and nerve and vision and power will be more than adequate for whatever you have to do this week, this year, and the rest of your life. God does not leave God's people stranded. God will give you everything you need. And because God is so generous, God will also give to all the others everything that they need. God will raise up plenty 
of men, women, boys, and girls to do the work of compassion, justice, honesty, mercy, truth-telling, and love that God wants to be done. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let us pray. We tremble to pray this, Lord, but we pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon us. We tremble because we know that when your Spirit pours forth, you summon your people to do daring, bold, and risky things for the sake of your kingdom. And so we tremble, but we also thrill to pray that you would pour out your Spirit upon us because we sense that you are calling us to be your body, to be your agents of reconciliation, mercy, and love in this community and the world in the days ahead. So we pray, O oh God, with every fiber of our being, that you would pour out your Spirit upon us. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.